equally. All right. All right, so this is quantum field theory one, part one, and uh, lecture one. So we're going to be talking about why, what is quantum field theory and why? Why are we interested in it? Why would we want to study them? So lecture one, the topic is going to be about, is going to be this, from particles to fields. So what are we going to explain today? Hopefully by the end of this lecture, you're going to have the answer to these four questions, or you will have an understanding of these four points that I'm going to make, right? But it's good to have an idea of a map of where we're going. First, I want you guys to remind, I want to remind you guys of this phenomenon you should remember, you could, you probably remember from quantum mechanics, which is the wave particle duality. It says that basically there, will, there are two ways to construct theories of nature. One is in terms of particles, and alternatively, and equivalently, we could construct theories of nature in terms of fields. Then I'll try to argue why fields are more fundamental from the perspective of high energy theory. So quantum field theories of particle physics. And then I'll try to argue why fields are more fundamental from the low energy perspective, quantum field theories of condensed matter physics. But the punchline is going to be strong interactions. That is why in the low energy and high energies, quantum fields are more fundamental or have an, we have an advantage, if talking about in terms of formula theory, in terms of fields has an advantage over particles. In particular, as an example, I want you guys to have in mind, there are many theories that we do know of. Some of them apply to laboratory physics that are interacting, genuinely interacting theories and they have absolutely no particle descriptions. Examples include all sorts of conformal field theories, in case you're interested. All right. Um, so if I say something, by the way, along the way, and you want examples, let me know. All right. And finally, I will try to give you some sort of working definition of quantum field theory. It's going to be very, very uh, informal. And uh, I'll, I'll mention two things, three things as basic principles of quantum field theory. When people say quantum field theory, Different people mean different things. And this is part of the fact, that part of the story that is work in development, right? But often physicists mean three principles, symmetry, locality, and renormalization. These are going to be big, important parts of this course, different parts of the course, but I'm just going to mention them so that, that you are familiar with the terminology. All right. Any questions about today's lecture, where we are going? Hopefully we're going to make it to the end. All right. Okay, so particles versus fields. Um, to orient ourselves, it's always good to start with the electromagnetic fields and photons as examples of the particle wave duality. So you have an electromagnetic wave that is elect electric field, vector field, and magnetic vector field. And once you have a wave propagating in space, you don't even need to describe to have charges. To describe the, the electric field, right? The electric and magnetic field, which you probably know from relativity, could be or your your advanced uh, electromagnetic magnetism course could be described as a four vector, right? A mu nu. This is vector potential. Um, this vector potential, um, it could be described in terms of a vector potential at every point in space, right? So there are two pictures. One is in terms of an electromagnetic wave. This is a field in space-time, a vector we associate to every point in space-time. An alternative picture provided by quantum mechanics is a traveling photon. If you have a wave, an electromagnetic wave that's one moving your, along, if it has the right, you know, like if it has the right uh, properties, it will be described by a single photon propagating space as a particle, right? So photons are the quanta of the electromagnetic field. That's what we usually say. So we could describe the same phenomenon, this propagating photon, in two different ways. We could talk about it as a photon, or we could talk about it as a field, as a wave, as a wave which is an excitation of a field, a particular field, right? So any questions so far? Hopefully this is a review. So the story of the particle wave duality 
doesn't stop at the level of electromagnetic fields. In fact, in fact, one lesson we've learned from quantum mechanics is that, is that it applies to all particles that we know of. For instance, electrons, that's what we're, uh, we're going to be talking a lot about this in this course, are particles, but they also behave as waves. So you could think of them as a wave packet. We often say wave packet, right? Or you could think of it as a particle. So there are both descriptions. And when we think of it as a wave, it will be, will be we're talking about a function in space-time that we're going to call electron field, right? All right, so um, here I'm going to make a quick comment. Well, actually, no, let me skip this comment. The comment will make sense at the end of the uh, lecture. All right, any questions? Actually, let, let me say it now. So if you have a particular uh, electron, there's a wave packet here, for example, in my office, and then one of you guys have a wave packet. Yes. Somebody had a question? My question is, uh, what does it mean to be more fundamental? We'll, we'll describe that. But, uh, but very like briefly, a... as I said, there are theories of nature. There are theories that describe laboratory phenomena that have no particle descriptions, but they have field descriptions. That's what I mean by calling one more fundamental than the other. All right? OK, so yes. Uh, so by being more fundamental, can that, uh, so the kind of field description reproduce what particle description uh, will explain? No. Well, well, we'll go through this in more detail, but as I said, there are theories where you could use the two pictures, particles and fields, alternate like equivalently, they're equivalent, but there are theories that have descriptions only in terms of fields, and there are no particle descriptions. If you stick to the particle description, you will never be able to describe these theories. Okay, I see. Thank you. Sure. But we'll, we'll get there. All right. So as I said, and there are two fundamental ways of describing um, wave, wave particle duality tells you that there are two fundamental ways of this framework to describe nature. One is as a, uh, in a framework, a framework that says fundamental building blocks are particles, right? And of course, uh, a single particle is boring, right? We're interested in bringing particles next to each other, making them interact and do all sorts of crazy things. A lot of times we're working with not one, two, three particles, but as condensed matter theories know pretty well, we're often working with billions and billions or an Avogadro or a number of particles, right? So in these situations, we are dealing with many particles. Physics is difficult. However, statistics comes to, uh, it, it, it saves us, right? It saves the day. So we often talk about something that's called the thermodynamic limit. This is a limit where we take the number of particles to infinity, volume to infinity, keeping the density, the number of particles per unit of space fixed. In this regime, statistical methods help us formulate a tractable theory of many particle physics, right? So the many body physics often is intimately tied with uh, statistical physics. Right? And if you want to describe uh, nature and taking particles as the fundamental building blocks, that is really sort of the route to go. All right? Um, now, the other alternative, the, al al the alternative is to describe um, fields as the fundamental fields as fundamental building blocks. So you could think of them as quote unquote functions. Now, at some point in this course, I'll, I'll tell you why quote unquote functions in space-time. Think of them as a fluid that moves around in space-time, right? Like think of it as, for example, a, an example of a field is temperature at any point in space-time. Or when you have a fluid, right? You could think of it as like, you know, uh, as, a, as some sort of a field in space-time. This is what quantum field theory is going to be about. Quantum field theory is going to be about constructing a framework to describe nature where the fundamental building blocks will be fields, right? And in part three of the course, part four of the course, we'll spend quite a bit of time 
to explain what is a particle in this framework. Because in the framework of quantum field theory, a priori is unclear what a particle is, right? So we're going to spend some time telling you guys, trying to figure out what a particle is and when is there a problem. When is there something uh, that's called a particle? All right. One important lesson that I want you guys to think about and have in mind for a very, very long time is going to be important in this course, general in physics, is that there is one important idea, one of the biggest ideas in physics in, of 21st, 20th century. And that is physics is organized in scales. You often talk about length scales or the correspondingly high energy scales, right? So if I if I think of length scales, short wavelength, short length scales, those are high energy phenomena, right? We often call them UV, ultraviolet, right? Long wavelength is infrared, and these are longer distances, lower energies, right? Condensed matter theory or many body physics a lot of times works with long distances that regime, right? And then quantum field, the quantum field, uh, sorry, all short distances often appear in particle physics. Now, in this lecture, I'll try to argue in that in both of these regimes, quantum field theory is natural, important, and relevant, right? So quantum field theories naturally appear in short distances. Quantum field theories naturally appear in long distances for somewhat different reasons. All right. Any questions so far? All right. So to build up towards this argument that what what why fields are more fundamental, let me just point out a few of the advantages of fields over particles. First of all, field theory is intrinsically many body. In description of particles, you will start with a single particle, for example, a single photon, and then that gives you a field configuration, a mu of x and t in space time. Then if you want to construct many photons, you basically take another field configuration, which in a theory where foot like QED, where photons don't interact, photons don't self-interact. The theory is linear. There are no interactions between photons, between the particles of the theory. So the overall field is just the sum of the field's individual parts, right? You just sum them up. That's what it means for the theory to be free. That's what it means for the theory to be linear. Now, the moment you have interactions, self-interactions, this linearity goes to hell, right? So it's no longer true that two particles is the sum of two things, because they interact, the, you have to solve the Schrodinger equation. And what solves the Schrodinger equation is not the sum of the two solutions corresponding to the two particles. Now, when the interactions become strong, nonlinearities are very strong, there could be simply no connection between the solution that you find for two particles and the two individual particles. All right? So, but. All of this in the language of field is all unified. You're only talking about a single field as a function of space. It's just intrinsically many particle physics. It doesn't have a notion of a one particle, two particle, three particle, a priori. Just a field, right? It's intrinsically many particles. So that's why field theory sort of already in it has many body physics, has a statistical physics. All right, so that's one advantage. Another advantage that comes up in relativistic theories is this. Field theory allows for pair creation. So if you have quant, so let me just talk, describe to you a phenomenon that happens and actually won the Nobel Prize in 1948 or something when it was first discovered. It was the observation that once you put quantum mechanics and special relativity next to each other, particle number is not conserved. You take an atom, you shoot a photon, you send a particle, quantum of electromagnetic field to it, it hits the atom and gives atom some momentum. What comes out is not a photon, it's an electron and a positron, two different particles, right? So it seems like if you were to describe this phenomenon from the language of particles, 
it seems ridiculous, right? Particle number is not conserved. You can exchange these different particles of different types, right? So constructing a theory that's just purely in terms of particles is at the very least inconvenient, if not impossible. It's actually inconvenient in this example. All right. So just a few more words about this phenomenon. How do we describe this? Actually, pair creation is very, very universally happens in quantum field theory at all times, all the time. So to argue for that, it's just very simple. It's a simple consequence of relativity and quantum mechanics. How? Heisenberg, inequal Heisenberg uncertainty relation tells you that momentum, that delta P, right? That precision in momentum is lower bounded by H bar over delta X. Then relativity tells you that momentum is part of a four vector where the time element of it is energy. So uncertainty in momentum is similar to uncertainty in energy. If you just multiply by C on the right hand side, speed of light, that tells you, and then relativity tells you that delta E is two times mass and energy are the same thing, right? So if you try to take a particle and squeeze it in very, very small delta X distance, squeeze it in a very small region, that tells you that the energy, the uncertainty in energy becomes so large that it might be enough to create a pair of particles. So you thought you were squeezing, a, you were localizing a single particle in a small region of space, and all of a sudden, you're confronted with this possibility of having more than one part. Pair production occurring in spontane spontaneously, right? The wavelength, the typical, the scale that this happens, but that's just these equalities is H4 over mass uh, over MC, right? So if you want, as I said, if you want to try to localize a single particle at some distances like this, You'll, you'll, you'll struggle to make sense of it as a single particle, right? So in terms of scales, if you view it, there is a scale below which, this is the De Broglie Bro 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 wavelength, below which the wave nature of the particle becomes important. And then there is a, there is a scale further down where a single particle picture just falls apart. And this is the Compton wavelength that we just discussed, right? This scale is Compton wavelength. It's almost smaller than uh, the, 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 the scale where wave nature becomes important. But this is just a manifestation of that. There's this beautiful code that summarizes the, the idea that we, that the dilemma that we're facing. There are just simply no one single, one particle systems in nature in the presence of interactions. That's just not possible, right? All right, so what are the options we're left with? Either we're going to be working with fields, that's going to be quantum field theory, which is the topic of this course, or we're going to have many particle theory all at once. Meaning what? Meaning that you can't talk about a theory of three particles, four particles. You should have a theory that at the same time allows for every, an arbitrary number of particles. So what is that concept? That's a concept that's called Hawk space which is you take a, you take the Hilbert space of n particles and you just direct some of them. You add these Hilbert spaces together to allow for particle creation. So when you create a particle, you transition from H with lower, let's say you create a pair of particles from vacuum. You go from H zero, which is the Hilbert space of the vacuum to Hilbert space of two particles. It's already pretty clear that this, this language is cumbersome at the very least. Right? But that's what the notion of a Fox space is, where you allow for, so you take your Schrodinger equation and solve it for n particles, you get a Hilbert space of solutions, right? And then you have to allow, you have to add to this Hilbert space, the Hilbert space of every single possibility with different number of particles, right? And then the point is that there are processes that change particle number. Part three of the course is going to be about hashing this out like more in detail. This is called the phenomenon of second quantization or canonical quantization, where you start with a single particle Hilbert space and you construct the Fox space out of it. This is called second quantization, in case this has come up you know, somewhere. All right, so it's a good point to pause. Are there any questions?
I have a question about why the fox face is constructed as it is, but I presume you will uh, discuss that during when you teach. You yeah, will, uh, will discuss be, fox will be, uh, we'll, we'll discuss fox face in uh, okay. more detail. Okay. All right. Good. So, so far in summary, we said the field theory is intrinsically many body, so it's convenient. Also, it allows for pair creation, which is a phenomenon we observe in nature in relativistic theories. Now, there are other reasons to like field theories, quantum field theory, because it also explains naturally a whole set of other phenomena we observe in nature, such as antiparticles, the connection between spin and statistics, and a lot more. All right, we just go over this. Quickly, we're gonna come back and describe all of these, but I'm gonna take the point of view of an experimentalist, right? We're just discovering particles in nature and we observe that particles come in pairs. If I have a particle of mass M and charge Q, there is a particle that's called this antiparticle, has the exact same mass and negative charge. So if you just wanna to stick to the theory of particles, this is given to you, this is magic. It just happens, you have to take it as an assumption. This is just how particles organize themselves. I happen to be living in a nature where this happens, right? For example, there's an electron, there's a positron. Positron that has the exact same mass, but the opposite charge. There's a proton, there's an antiproton, right? A theory of pure particles cannot explain this. There are also particles, if you're wondering, uh, there are also particles that are their own antiparticles. Mm -hmm. So, Famously, Dirac was very obsessed with this problem. He was aware of this, and he constructed a whole theory. It's called particle hole theory to explain why there is a positron next to an electron, right? So why he his his particle hole theory he constructed a theory that condensed matter theories learn and love. Uh, some of us who are in high energy, we might never really learn about this systematically, but condensed matter theories know this theory pretty well. This theory, he invented it to explain the existence of antiparticles for fermions, for electrons. But this whole part theory is crucially relies on uh, the exclusion principle, which is a phenomenon only for fermions, right? It won't apply to bosons. So there is no way of explaining the existence of antiparticles for bosons from a particle perspective, right? This you just have to take it for granted. It's not an inconsistency, it's an inconvenience. Now, it turns out that quantum field theory explains it, explains that why there are antiparticles for bosons and fermions, that's very natural in the framework. There's another phenomenon, which is fundamental particles are identical, right? So if you have, you probably learn, remember from your quantum mechanics, if you have identical particles, once you have, particles have statistics, Meaning that once you have several of them, they could be bosons or fermions or para, have parasitistics. You probably haven't learned about parasitistics. But bosons and fermions is about, if you take the wave function of two uh, photons, if you the wave function is the sum between particle, photon one and two here and here, plus the reverse, right? So it's symmetric under swap. Whereas uh, for fermions, you pick a minus sign. Right? This is called statistics. This, is, this plays an important role in statistical physics, right? When you get the, uh, you go from Boltzmann distribution to Dirac Fermi versus um, the other one, right? Now, fundamental particles also have a, have a property, an intrinsic uh, property called spin. It's an observed fact that there is a connection between spin and statistics, right? Particles with integer spin are have bosonic statistics. Particles with half integer spin have fermionic statistics. At this level, from the point of view of the theory of particles, this is just a fact. You've got to accept it. There's no way of explaining this. Actually, I'm lying a little bit. If you know that anti, if you could explain antiparticles, there is a way of explaining this, but you can't explain antiparticles anyway. Right? However, quantum field theory explains this. It's actually a theorem we're going to discuss and prove in our course. It's called spin statistics theorem. It's one of the main, I guess, early uh, successes of quantum field theory. All right. 
Good. Any questions? So we named four advantages for uh, why fields, advantages for using fields as fundamental building blocks in high energies as opposed to using particles, right? In summary, is quantum field theory was a little bit more unified. It was a lot, more, it was explaining a lot more and it was sort of like going around a lot of inconveniences that you had to introduce by hand to construct the theory of particles. But so far, I didn't mention any fundamental obstruction, right? This is all from the point of view of quantum field theories that are relativistic. These are high energy uh, things, right? These are in short distances, UV theories. Now, quantum field theory, as I claimed earlier, makes another appearance, this time at low energies. So in condensed matter, often at very low energies, we're dealing with particles that are moving much slower than the speed of light. So Newtonian approximation, relativistic uh, answers are just like overkill. We could easily work with, treat them as like Newtonian Galilean uh, particles, right? Do we, should we care for quantum field theory? The answer is yes. If you're interested in long distance, low energy physics, it's very natural and also almost uh, inevitable to use quantum field theory. So why is that? I'll try to give a quick argument as two of the reasons why quantum field theories appear in low energies in condensed matter. We will not have time, unfortunately, to do justice to this in this course. It's a whole different field of research called critical phenomena. And you can spend a lifetime studying this. I absolutely encourage you guys to learn about this. This is, is intimately tied to the origins of Wilsonian quantum field theory. So when Wilson, Wilson played a major role in developing this, and it really changed the framework, the way that we think about condensed matter. It really revolutionized it. All right, so here's a claim. The claim is that quantum field theory, the description of fields is preferred in low energies or long distances. So low compared to what, with respect to what, or long distances with respect to what. With, usually when you have theories, you have massive particles, right? These particles move around. And inverse mass is some sort of a length scale. When you look at scales that are much larger than your inverse mass scales, this, this occurs in critical phenomena. We'll, we'll, we'll quickly mention this. This is where quantum field theory becomes inevitable. It, it, it's sort of forced on you. The other regime that you could talk about is the hydrodynamics. When you're, you have a thermal wavelength, right? That's where the time scale of typical uh, thermal fluctuations. But you're interested in uh, modes that are much longer wavelength than that. This is the regime of hydrodynamics. From the point of view of hydrodynamics, Everything is a field, right? You have well, you have a velocity field in space. You have a density field in space. These are continuous functions. So hydrodynamics could be understood as a field theory. Now, constructing a quantum field theory of hydrodynamics has proven to be very, very hard. We have maybe in the past ten years we've actually managed to have a satisfactory picture. But the fact that it is hydrodynamics is a field theory is something that is not uh, debatable. All right, so let me try to actually give you a little bit more intuition. Imagine you have it, we're gonna actually, the next lecture is precisely going to about the details of this, but I'm just gonna try to uh, give some sort of fruit hand wavy arguments. Imagine you have a theory of a whole bunch of, uh, a whole bunch of spins, right? These are spin or say, say it's Heisenberg models. These are rotors, right? These are vector, little uh, vectors that sit on a lattice and they take values, for example, three-dimensional systems of magnets, right? When you cool down the system, you look at low, low energies, a lot of the times low energy excitations look like this. So the magnets basically align themselves to gradually go around and they form this. So if you look at a mode all the way here and a mode all the way, oh, sorry, a mode very, very far in this direction, uh, in this, oh, um, oh, I cannot do it. Very far in this direction, 
There are no correlations between them. There's a typical correlation length, which is basically one length of this, right? Anything that's farther out are not correlated. There are correlations within this box, right? When the correlation length becomes large, that is the regime where everything is well approximated by fields, smoothly varying fields. So to give a little bit more detail, think of it this way. What we're gonna do, we're gonna start with a system of spins and do coarse grain, meaning what? You have a, like a two-dimensional array of spins, for example, an Ising model, and you're looking at the state that a bunch of these guys are up, a bunch of them are down, right? So what you're gonna do is that you're gonna block these spins together and replace the all of these guys, right? with an average magnetization. What's average magnetization? You're just um, you're just summing all the spins of n spins in this box, right? And dividing by the number. And that's going to be a collective degree of freedom for that box, right? It's going to be an effective degree of freedom for that box. Magnetization by definition takes the value between minus one and one because individual, uh, individual spins are one or minus one. However, as opposed to individual spins, it could take all sorts of values in between them. In fact, when the size of boxes becomes large and large, larger and larger, or said differently, the size of boxes fixed, but you squeeze in more and more spins, magnetization becomes a continuous parameter. It becomes a function, smoothly varying function of space time. That is the regime where field theory come, becomes important, right? Now, what is that? There is a correlation length here. Correlation length is it's a regime, the quantum field theory, if you want to be very uh, rigorous, emerges in the so-called continuum limit. This is a regime where the correlation length divided by the size of the, the lattice spacing goes to infinity, and the number of, of particles within each box goes to infinity. Right? So this is the regime of continuum limit. If, if this was too quick, uh, don't worry about it. We're going to discuss this in this course, or if there is no time in the next course, uh, part two of the course. But this is something that I'm quite sure you will have to deal with. If you, as a physicist, it's one of the deepest intuitions that we have actually learned in the 20th century, right? When you average out things, discrete variables become more and more smooth until it could be approximated at very, very large distances, long distances with smoothly varying function of space time, otherwise known as fields, right? That is the, one of the key relevances of quantum field theory deep in the infrared at very, very long distances. All right, any questions? Right, we're doing well with the time. Any questions? I encourage you guys to ask questions because I went over a lot of material already, right? But this is this this first lecture is very pedagogical, well, sort of like heuristic. We're we're just trying to motivate again. We call why quantum field theory, and I haven't told you what it is. Well, I sort of told you a little bit about what it is, but. It's a theory where the fundamental building blocks are fields. It appears naturally in very, very short distances and in very, very large distances due to two different phenomena. phenomena. At very long distances, it comes out of the so-called continuum limit, right? And for those of you guys who care about critical phenomena or condensed matter, they, they basically come out, come out when the Correlation length goes to infinity, becomes very, very large. That's the regime where quantum field theories appear. You have no choice but using them. The other regime is fundamental physics. This is the regime where you're actually interested in very, very small distances. And as I argued, because of this Compton wavelength, there's a length scale below which it makes no sense to think of, makes it makes no sense to talk about single particles, right? That's again a regime where you need to talk about fields, quantum fields. So quantum fields appear in the UV, they appear in the IR. Turns out the framework is actually the same. So there's a you could spend your whole life studying this. As I said, it's a field in development. All right, any questions?
Uh, I have a question. There... Absolutely. Oh, you go. Uh, okay, sorry. Yeah. Uh, you were mentioning something about hydrodynamics and why, even though that is clearly a field theory, it's hard to bring it into this framework. Can you maybe say a little bit about that? Uh, well, we, we now understand how to do it, but the issue was diffusion. So the issue was that hydrodynamics naturally comes with uh, it, it energy diffuses and for technical reasons, it was very difficult for a very long time to include that in the framework. But now we sort of understand how that works. It's, um, yeah, it has to do with energy conservation, but, or entropy generation, sorry, maybe I should say entropy generation, generation of entropy. But that, that's a very cryptic comment. I'm happy to tell you more about it offline. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Is is there an intermediate energy scale between UV and IR? Absolutely. There's plenty in the middle. That's where you got people do numerics. That's the regime where physics is. So you see, this is as physicists, we do the spherical cow approximation. When you study a cow, you first zoom out, the cow looks like a to the first to zeroth order looks like a sphere. So you study it as a sphere. That's quantum field theory. Then you try to add a little bit to it. So what we do here, actually, uh, let me, there's a very beautiful story. So in the very, very middle, it's very hard to formulate anything. We often have to resort to numerics. That's where the theory is often strongly coupled, strongly interacting. It's very difficult, right? This regime, this end and this end are reasonable. Then we usually do perturbation theory in this direction and in this direction, right? So we do perturbation theory around the UV. That's what actually perturbative quantum field theory is all about. We do perturbation theory in the IR. This is where perturbative quantum field theories of condensed matter are all about. And then there is this like middle regime where phenomena are just hard, right? That's where QCD confines. And you, all of a sudden you have protons and we have no idea. It's a $1 million problem to figure out why QCD confines, right? Because our tools are perturbative and they work in the two ends, right? So deep in the UV, deep in the infrared, and it's hard to make sense of, well, to understand the middle, but we're making progress. Did I address it? Yeah, in short, it's just fine. It's just fine. Mm -hmm. That's where atomic physics is, that's where molecular physics is, that's where chemistry is. That's why condensed matter, neither condensed matter theorists nor quantum field theorists claim to uh, chemistry is trivial. You know, chemistry sits in, the, in here. Chemistry is here, right? Biology is here. We cannot use perturbative quantum field theory to explain biology. All right, another yeah. question. I had I had a, a small question. So uh, just as you approach like the, the broadly wavelength from something that is macroscopic, you can use like WKB methods as a semi-classical approximation. Is there something like a semi-QFT approximation from non-relativistic mechanics, quantum mechanics to, to QFT, or is that a wrong way to think about that limit? Uh, sorry, let, let me see if I understand. So non-relativistic uh, quantum field theories are important. Uh, they exist. They're natural. We do talk about them. We do study them. Um, usually relativity as a symmetry, symmetry is make the theories more restricted, right? Symmetries are, we use symmetries to classify theories because it's simpler. Symm the more symmetric the theory is, the easier it is. So the relativistic quantum field theories are a lot more restricted, a lot easier to study. Non-relativistic quantum field theories exist. They are important and interesting, but there's a zoo of them. That's harder to understand and classify and wrap our head around, right? So this is one comment, um, but I, th I think you mentioned something else. I might have gone on a tangent. Uh, you mentioned semi uh, WKB approximation. Um, right. Yeah, like, so, yeah, go if, ahead. if you have a, a problem that's around the Broglie wavelength, then using WKB approximation, it's a kind of a good ah. gauge to relate classical and, and quantum effects. Well, using that yeah. picture, so as I said, you see this this Compton wavelength, or no, sorry, here. The Broglie wavelength is when. Uh, you're confronted with the wave nature, right? With using WKB or a lot of other techniques, you could keep pushing with the particle picture, right? Or you could keep pushing with your solution. Actually, let, let me say uh, quickly like this. What is WKB? WKB is when you're trying to solve the Schrodinger equation, right? 
And it's hard, it's very hard and difficult. You do an approximation. And this approximation is only valid in some sort of adiabatic regime where some things are slowly varying, right? So this is sort of like insisting, let's say you have two particles that you're bringing closer and closer. Yeah, so the interaction is getting stronger and stronger. In some sort of an approximation, you could still construct a solution out of the two single particles, right? That is the topic of WKB. But as the interactions get stronger and stronger at some point, everything goes to hell. It just becomes impossible, right? These approximation methods just gets you a little bit further. Right? You won't be able to just use the, uh, these WQP approximation to find nonlinear solution, exact solutions to nonlinear equations of motion. Right? They're all valid in some approximation. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Uh, would you say that uh, quantum field theory reduced to non-relativistic uh, quantum mechanics uh, in certain limits? Uh, okay, so uh, a few things. The one particle sector of quantum field theory is just single particle quantum mechanics, period. Moreover, one thing I didn't tell you, so quantum field theory is like grand formality. Uh, I didn't tell you what dim dimension of space-time quantum field theory was living in. If I define quantum field theory in zero plus one dimensions, zero space dimension and time, that's literally quantum mechanics. So quantum mechanics is understood as an example of a quantum field theory. Now, you might think that, oh, so quantum mechanics is easier than quantum field theory. Quite the opposite. Because of the principles that we're going to insist on, locality and symmetries, space-time symmetries, when you go to zero dimensions, you lose all the power of space-time symmetries. You get quantum mechanics, but all the beautiful tools of quantum filter are somewhat useless, right? Because you you don't, you know, like, as a grand framework, it includes quantum mechanics. But the, as I said, quantum field theory, when we say it, we often mean there is like a, uh, there is a, some sort of footnote, right? We mean, some particular properties such as locality and elasticity, space-time symmetries, quantum mechanics is zero plus one dimensional P of T, but in a boring way, because all these beautiful tools and techniques that we have just go to hell and we can't do much. Did I address it? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Sure. All right, so now um, a, an important comment about why are fields more fundamental in the infrared for condensed matter theories. This is important. I just argued that in long distances, the average fields, the, uh, the average magnetization or average properties become slowly varying smooth functions of space time. So we have a field here. But as a condensed matter theorist, you might tell me that, oh, this is a theory, quantum theory. So you have the wave particle duality, but there should be some sort of particle dual to these infrared physics, these infrared emergent fields. What are these particles? These particles, if they exist, that's the big if, are called quasi-particles in the language of condensed matter theory, right? These are particles that could emerge in the infrared, like for high energy theories, an example would be pions, right? These are particles that emerge in the infrared out of these infrared quantum field theories, they are the quanta of the infrared fields, right? However, important thing is that they might not always emerge. They sometimes emerge. Not every theory deep in the infrared has quasi-particles. Sometimes they simply don't. The theory is genuinely interacting. And what it is is a quantum soup. It's a mess. It's a mess of fields fluctuating in space-time wildly, and there is no clear approximation. The theory is so strong, so, so nonlinear, that there's no intuition or I, a way of making sense of individual particles. This is where I come to this uh, drawing. So let's say you have two photons, photon, like, sorry, electrons. So each of them has this wave packet like this. And there is another wave packet like this, and they are very far away. 
So when they're very far away, the potential interaction between them is small. The sum of the two wave packets saw almost all the Schrodinger equation. But as you bring them closer and closer, the interaction gets larger. The solution might be look like a mess like this. If I look at this, there is no way for me to guess this was two particles. In fact, this has nothing to do with the sum of the two functions. The theory is nonlinear, right? Equations of motion are nonlinear because of interactions. And there's simply no simple quasi-particle picture, particle, single particle picture. Right? That is how interaction kill the thing. Oh, sorry, I, 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 want, I said this to say something. So now let's say there is a length scale at which interaction becomes large. When we say strong coupling, this is a regime where interaction is strong at all scales. What you have is just a mess. What you have in space-time is just a crazy function. Uh, it's not even oscillating like this. It's a soup. Just think of it as a soup. It's a messy field, and there's no clear way of saying, oh, there's an excitation here. There's an excitation here. There's no way of doing that. So the theory is strong couple with no picture of particles. Let me elaborate a little bit more. I'm just going to repeat basically what I said. In long distances, you might have two individual solutions for shorting your equation. And locality, the principle of locality, tells you that the interactions should die away at the out of the infinity, right? So there's a sense in which as you separate them far enough, there are two particles. So this approximately solves the Schrodinger equations. But as you bring them together, you could get all sorts of things. You could get bound states. You could get all sorts of crazy things that have no interpretation in terms of two particles. For instance, a proton is one such thing. There's a theory that we love and care about called QCD. The fundamental particles of those field is quark. These are quarks, up and down quarks. But turns out that when you go deep in the infrared, you never see quarks. There are simply no quarks in our universe. If I look around, there are no quarks. No quarks have ever been observed at these temperatures, right? Quarks always form this mess, a ball that's called a proton. Proton is a quasi-particle that appears somehow in the very low energies. And it's not like, it's not really a clear, uh, even though we show, we draw this picture, there's two up, up, two up quarks and down quarks. This picture is a misnomer. It's really, it's confusing. It's, it's incorrect somewhat. Because there's like a gluon, all sorts of gluons that bind these guys together. This is a balanced state. It's some mess like this. So you're not guaranteed that the infrared, you're going to have quasi-particles. You have to work with fields. All right. With that said, let's, so hopefully up to this point, I argued for you guys that fields are important. Quantum field theory appears naturally. And they're important and somewhat more fundamental than the particle picture. They appear in deep in the UV, short distances, deep in the IR, long distances. Now, let's just spend a few minutes, the last few minutes of the lecture, talking about what is quantum field theory, what the hell is quantum field theory. It's a field in development. I'm not going to give you a definition that satisfies the mathematician, but let me just be qualitative, and gradually as we go along, we're going to make this a little bit more precise. It's a theoretical framework that quantizes fields as fundamental building blocks of nature. So what does that mean? It means that the basic degrees of freedom are operator valued functions of space time. Let's just go over that a little bit slower. You have an equation of motion that is classical field theory. Lecture three, four are going to be about what classical fields are. Classical fields come with equations of motion. There will be an equation of motion similar to Schrodinger equation, but this is classical. But right. this is, yeah, there's a there's an equation of motion. There will be functions that solve functions of space time that solve these equations of motion. To every solution, we associate an operator. And we usually write it as an integral over space time, the solution of space time integrated against a kernel that we colloquially in physics call a field operator. So these Functions, these operators, these 
Operator valued functions of space time are the fundamental degrees of freedom. Right? In this course, we're not gonna, we're, we just have finite amount of time, limited amount of time. So we're gonna go over two crucial ways of, key ways of thinking about quantum field theory. One is second quantization. If you recall, this is a picture that connects the particles, the Fox space of particles, right? One particle plus two particles plus three particles plus arbitrary number of particles to free quantum fields. So just this is this is something we do to just make sure we understand what we're describing. This is called canonical quantization. This is called second quantization. Right? Perhaps in usually typical QFT text would call this canonical quantization. The other thing that we do is path integral approach. So this is as path integrals allow you a systematic way invented by Feynman and friends is a systematic way of including perturbations to the Fox space, per, sorry, perturbative correction in the Fox uh, to the theory, including interactions perturbatively. And perhaps, that's a big perhaps, because not to the satisfaction that mathematicians want, but to the what the satisfaction that physicists want, it gives you a non-perturbative definition of this quantum soup, these strongly coupled, strongly interacting quantum field theories. Because it's a huge challenge to describe such theories. It's a very active area of research. And it's sort of like perhaps I would say it's the unsolved, one of the most important unsolved problems of physics is understanding non-perturbative quantum field theory. What the hell is the definition? How do you deal with it? What's the framework? All right. One last slide is the basic principles of quantum field theory, because not everybody means the same thing about quantum field theory. I'll mention three things. There are more. If I if I were to come up with axioms of quantum field theory that satisfies the mathematicians, I'll have to list more. But let's just list the list these three because they are physically crucial, very crucial, very important. The first one is symmetry. We're going to spend part three of the course in discussing this in detail. It's going to be a lot of mathematics, but I, I, I encourage you to sit through it and learn it because symmetry is one of the most important guiding principles of physics. The notion of locality, which is going to be part seven, hopefully we'll get there. We'll see how far, this is the first time I teach QFT, we'll see how far we're going to get. Um, and then renormalization, which is going to be part eight. Um, these are three things I know that I haven't defined it for you, but I want you guys to keep the names in mind because it will come up. Now, there's a you're, we're set for a surprise. The surprise is that these three principles are so restricted that often, as opposed to quantum mechanics, you're so restrictive that the Hamilton, the, the form of the interaction, if not in a lot of cases, is uniquely fixed. If you insist on symmetry, if you fix the symmetries and locality and ask for normalization principles, the interaction cannot be in some wacky arbitrary. So you can't create unicorns and stuff out there in particle physics. You are very, very restricted. You have to stick to very specific forms of interaction. And the theory is very, very restricted. This was sort of shock because once we talked about quantum mechanics, a priori, I can write down any Hamiltonian for a particle. Right, uh, as long as it's just self-adjoint and has a uh, has a, bound, a spectrum which is bounded below, it, it goes right. But here, we are very restricted by symmetries, locality, and renormalization. And of course, the larger the symmetry group, the more restricted it is. That is why in physics we often study very very symmetric field theories. Examples: conformal field theories. Other examples: super symmetric field theories. The most symmetric thing possible, super conformal field theories. That's why my crowd studies, spends a lot of their time studying. Why do they do that? Why are they wasting tax dollar, uh, uh, the tax money? Because we want to study the theories where they are more restricted. And then hopefully use the intuition, build the intuition towards understanding theories that we care a lot about. All right. What is described by QFT? Well, you wouldn't be surprised if I told you that it's the most successful theory that humankind has made in the following sense that it has the most, it has a predictive power with the largest number of significant digits. That's the very 
a, a, a definition of a successful theory, and it beats every other theory that mankind has ever constructed. Second to Q of T is GR, general relativity. So the second on the list, and the two cannot come together, but that's a whole different story. But fundamental theories of particle physics, early universe cosmology, these are field theories, quantum gravity, string theory, these are field theories, many exotic uh, low energy phases of matter, superconductivity, these are all field theories, critical phenomena, phase transition physics, these are all field theories, hydrodynamics is field theory. In math, even if you don't give a damn about physics, Sometimes field theories come along and tell you how to come up with topological invariance for manifolds and do all sorts of interesting cool math that you would have never guessed you would need field theory for. Anyway, with that, we'll end this lecture. Are there any questions? I have one question. Yes. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, field theories can describe particles, uh, particle interactions. Uh, you said that uh, there are exist field theories which, which have no particle interpretation. Yeah. But are there particle theories which have no field interpretation? Can you, again, does, does it work like that okay. also? No. No. Okay. Field theory, uh, as I said, the issue is strong coupling, right? The issue is really strong coupling. Um, I don't know. Maybe people haven't thought carefully about this, you know, but there has been no motivation to even explore that direction. There are lots of theories out there in our nature that we need to explain. And the only explanations that exist are field theoretic. And there, we do know there is no way to describe them using particles. Examples, pretty much uh, any critical phenomena, any, any continuous phase transition, sorry, any interesting continuous phase transition corresponds to CFT. And all the interesting CFTs, almost by definition, are those that have no particle description. All right. Good. Are we good? Yes, sir. Thank you. Sure. Any any last question? All right. If not, I'll just leave this last uh, this slide in front of you guys, and let me just go on a rant. Hopefully, you guys. I, I encourage you to think about these four points what we discuss in this course. Next lecture, when you come in, if there is something that's unclear, think about it and ask, right? The course, unfortunately, is gonna go really fast. Unfortunately, fortunately or not, uh, we are gonna need you guys to stay on board and follow a lot of calculations. It's, a, I, I, it's not your typical course. It will take a lot of work, hard work and Unfortunately, it's one of those things that if you get lost, you're going to get really lost, right? So please stop me if I'm going fast, right? I'm here to teach this course, not for my own sake. I've taken, as a grad student, I took four or five courses of quantum field theory and didn't understand the thing. But I'm still working on this and I'm still trying to understand this. I'm here to teach you guys something that's hopefully useful to you, right? So the course is not set in stone as we're going to go forward. Depending on your interests, we're going to move in different corners of this. Quantum field theory is enormous. It's an enormous topic. You can spend the rest of your life studying it. So it's unfair to have a single course to describe or two courses to describe quantum field theory. All right. With that, any last questions? Thank you so much. Please stay in touch on Slack and check the website. If there are any other issues, send me an email, but Slack is the best way. Thank you so much, guys. Have a nice afternoon. Thank you. Bye.